Okay, so this is going to be the video dealing with Act 5 of Macbeth. This will be the last video. Um, I'll be recording as you have your exam coming up on Monday. This is a reminder. Um, the exam is being held at the college. And actually, my numbers. Right. Well, I'll be posting them in any case. I believe it's room 201. The exam runs from 1 o'clock, our class time, 1 o'clock till 5 o'clock. So be on time, be prepared, goes without saying. And as I said, I'll be posting the information up onto Omnivox. Um, I'll get final confirmation tomorrow. But as I said, you should anticipate, I think it's room 201, and it's definitely running at the time of our class. Okay. Um, so we're going to look at Act 5, which we covered at length in class. So this is pretty much review. There are going to be a total of five videos on Macbeth, and we spent, I believe, six classes on it. Okay, so again, if you've been coming to class, you've been attentive and taking notes, you should be in good shape for the exam. My recommendation in terms of preparing for the exam is to reread the play. Now that you have accumulated all this uh, information regarding the play and our discussions revolving the different themes, and as we've noticed, there are many different themes that are unfolding in this play. Um, and um, yeah, an opportunity to reread the play straight through, if you can, will really put you in a good position um, come Monday. So, let's take a look. Okay, so, Act 5. Now, we start Act 5. Remember, we're going to see Lady Macbeth. We haven't seen Lady Macbeth for a while. Um, and so it's very noticeable that she was absent from Act 4. And when we last saw her, we were, she was still very much in uh, the character that we've come to recognize, um, planning, plotting, trying to protect Macbeth, right? Remember at the banquet scene when Macbeth is uh, seeing the ghost of Banqua, um, Lady Macbeth is trying to calm everyone down, telling everyone, don't worry, this is just an affliction that he has. He's had it since childhood. Um, and this all ties into that theme of deception, right? To be, how many times we've seen them say, um, you know, don't show what on your face what you're truly thinking. Um, and we've seen this a lot with Macbeth, right? Because he's the one who's had doubts before. He's the one who actually wanted to, not, uh, was trying to, uh, who made the decision not to go through with the murder of King Duncan, um, and she is, convinces him the playing on the element of what constitutes a man, that theme, which has been running throughout the play as well. You know, be a man, man up and do it. Um, she's always come across as being that strong one, remind you of her prayer to the gods to unsex her, make her more like a man. Uh, in order to do what these things, what she is deeming to be manly things, which is to basically commit brutal regicide to kill a king. Um, and we've talked about, as well about the approach that she in particular represents in terms of the consequences of such a heinous act, that um, there are no consequences unless you... Um, impose con consequences upon yourself, other than getting caught, of course. 
but in terms of the morality and the ethics of what they're doing. It's very much uh, Lady Macbeth is not concerned with that, not concerned with um, the consequences coming from a uh, higher uh, power, if you will, right? It's, and, and very much implying that this moral and ethical position that an individual adopts is very much predicated on their own determinations of what constitutes morality. And if they're ignoring that or they're not attentive to that, then it really comes down to just a matter of as long as we get away with it, we'll be fine. So don't worry. Now, when we see her in the first scene of Act Five, something has happened. And it's self imposed. They haven't been caught. Right? They've achieved what they set out to achieve. They've achieved, now importantly, right, this gets back to the, the free will versus predetermination. Um, they've achieved what the prophecy proclaimed they would achieve. But they took actions. Right, particularly the killing of King Duncan, in order to achieve it, which puts into question the whole idea of the prophecy. If they hadn't taken any action, would Macbeth still have become king? How would that have happened? Would it, would it, would it have happened? Um, but they did achieve it. And we have that little hint about the beginnings of her realization, if you will, that something is amiss in terms of her plan, not just in terms of achieving the status that they achieve, but in terms of how it impacts her, right? We, when, when she has that moment where she says, okay, we, we're here, we made it, he's king, I'm queen. Why am I not happy? What's wrong? This is what we said, though. This is what our ambition led us to, coupled with the prophecy. We're here. Why is there a problem? Why am I not happy? And at that point, we get that hint that she is going to start descending to where she ends up here in Act 5. And we also see that shift in Macbeth himself, whose attitude in regards to, the, to that moment is, uh, no, we've just started. It's not over. You know, it, 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 it's, it's now, there's much more to do. We've just started a new phase. It wasn't an end into itself. And it seems that Lady Macbeth was approaching like, you know, again, as I've mentioned many times, she's very short-sighted. She's not anticipating what's going to happen next. Macbeth then, after he has his turn, is very much concerned with what's going to happen next, very much concerned about preserving his status as king, anticipating that people are going to come after him, anticipating it because he knows how he became king. And if he could take such actions, then others could take actions as well. Lady Macbeth doesn't seem to realize this. And during this interim period, when we don't see Lady Macbeth, this sense of guilt, right? Guilt that has to be predicated on her recognition of the immorality and the unethical, extreme unethical nature of what she has participated in, what she, where she was a driving force, takes hold of her. And what we have in this opening scene is revealed to us, and we spent a lot of time, so I'm not going to spend too much time now on it, is in this state of sleepwalking, right? And remember, this harps back to um, when Macbeth says, you know, Macbeth has murdered sleep. There's no, no sleep anymore for us. There's no repose. There's no rest. We've crossed a line, right? And here we have a manifestation of that. Lady Macbeth can't sleep. When she sleeps, she sleepwalks. She's awake or asleep. 
and awake, eyes open, and she is racked with guilt. Right? And we have the, the famous image of, as we see here, right? What is it she does now? Look how she rubs her hands, right? What is she doing as she rubs her hand? It is an accustomed action with her to seem thus washing her hands. I have known her to continue this for a quarter of an hour. And we have Lady Macbeth saying, yet here's a spot, right? What is it a spot of? It's a spot of blood, right? So that image of the bloody hands, you have blood on your hand. Remember how she, treated that, how she, how she uh, reacted to Macbeth at, right after Macbeth had killed Duncan. And he comes in and he's covered in blood and his hands are full of blood and he's distraught. Remember that scene, very important scene. Um, and she's like, oh, come on, just go wash your hands. It's just blood. And Macbeth's response to that, if I were to wash my hands in all the oceans of the world, it would not get the blood off my hand. It would turn the oceans red with blood. And blood symbolizing this, this guilt. They have done something horrific, not just in terms of murder, but the regicide of killing a king and giving the king's position in that order of the nature, natural order of things, as a conduit, if you will, to God. And of course, as well, King Duncan was a kinsman of Macbeth. Macbeth was the host. He was in Macbeth's home. And Duncan was a good man, good king and good man, all these things. There's no way to rationalize or justify killing King Duncan other than to fulfill your ambition. That's what makes it so heinous. If, if King Duncan was a bad king, then there could be justification, but there is none. It is just an act of evil. Right. When Macduff kills Macbeth, who's king as well, but he's a terrible king. Even not just because he's killed Duncan, but as we've discussed in class, he's a terrible king in terms of a ruler. He's, he's let his power go to his head, coupled with the prophecies of the witches, inferring that he's invulnerable, he's, he can't be touched, and now he is a reckless, uncaring, the opposite of what King Duncan was. So there is justification for Macduff to kill a king if that king is such a horrific and bad king, even not just because of the way Macbeth became king, but because of the way he acts as king. Right? Malcolm as well is justified in, in, in leading the insurrection, if you will and bringing the troops from England because how bad Macbeth is and how he is not taking care of Scotland, right? Remember Macduff, as we've discussed, is all about the most, his, his um, priority is the state, is Scotland, right? When he is duped by Malcolm, and, and Malcolm is pretending that, that he would be worse than Macbeth. Remember, Macduff goes to Malcolm, you, you need to come back, we need to get rid of him. Macbeth, he's a terrible king, he's ruining our country. And Macduff pretends to be, oh well, yeah, you want me back? I'll be worse than Macbeth. Let me tell you why, I do this, I do that, I do this, I do that. And went over this in class. And, and then Macduff utterly despairs. Scotland, oh, Scotland. Scotland is doomed. I can't, you know, I, I, there was hope. The idea of Malcolm coming and replacing this horrific King Macbeth. But if Macduff, is, if, if Malcolm is this bad, then we, then, then we have no hope. And that's when Malcolm reveals, well, okay, I was just testing you. 
and you passed the test because what you demonstrated was your loyalty, another theme, um, and your sense of duty, another theme, to Scotland. And remember with Macduff, that duty, that prioritizing of Scotland, the state of Scotland, over and above his own family, who he left back in Scotland when he went to England to see Malcolm at terrible cost. Because Macbeth, remember, wipes out his entire family. We had that scene with Lady Macduff, furious at her, how could he leave us? And even Malcolm, when he initially starts his testing of Macduff, is saying, you know, how can I trust you if you, would, you wouldn't leave your family unprotected back in Scotland unless you were in cahoots with Macbeth and therefore you didn't fear for your family's safety. Macduff's attitude is such that my priority, even over and above my family, is to fix the state. Remember, we're working on three levels of disruption and the need to repair. It's on the individual basis. So we see the, 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 the turmoil and destruction of the Macbeths and, and, and what's going to happen in terms, is it possible to repair that? We see how that leads to the um, chaos and disruption of Scotland, the state, and, and that the governing of Scotland is falling apart. And people are miserably unhappy. And of course, we see that reflected in nature on the cosmological level, that the killing of a king, a, a legitimate just, a, uh, just king, disrupts nature itself because of that order of things with the king, the heavens, the king, and then the people below. And that disruption of that natural order of things leads to horses eating horses and earthquakes and so on that we saw earlier in the play. So this seems to all, even though we haven't seen the process, with Lady Macbeth, but this has now caught up with her. And now in her sleepwalking state, right, with her eyes are open, even though she's asleep, which means she is or she isn't, um, she is obsessed with what she sees as blood on her hands. And now again, we come back to that, um, idea of, you know, is there actually blood on her hands? It, 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 it harps back to the dagger scene with Macbeth, when he sees the dagger pointing the way, right, to go kill Duncan. Is that dagger really there? Or is that his mind playing tricks on him? When at the banquet, when Macbeth sees the ghost of Banqua, he is the only one who sees the ghost. Is the ghost actually there? Or is it a demonstration of the onset of madness, another potential theme in Macbeth's mind, that there is no ghost of Banquo there. It's Macbeth's mind losing his mind. Now we see another um, instance of this with Lady Macbeth seeing blood on her hands in this asleep awake state like this in-between state, whatever it may be. You see you're going, out, damned spot. Out, I say, one, two, why then? Tis time to do it. Hell is murky. Fie, my lord, fie, a soldier and a feared. What need we fear who knows it when none can call our power to account? No, no. What need we fear who knows it when none can call our power to account. Why should we fear? Right? So she, this is in this the state she's in, she's trying to hold on to that sensibility she had earlier, which was as long as we don't get caught, we're fine. There's nothing to be concerned. She berates Macbeth repeatedly over this. Man up, man, Macbeth. 
As long as we don't get caught, there's nothing, there's nothing, to, don't, what are you behaving like this for? She's trying to now convince herself of that here. Remind herself. And this is where we see such a stark reversal in her, her state of mind. Because then she says, yet who would have thought the old man to have, to have had so much blood in him, right? Fie, my lord, fie, a soldier and a feared. What, what need we fear who knows that when none can call our power to account? Yet, yet, who would have thought the old man to have so much blood? Right? So, I mean, again, we, is she losing her mind? Is she entering into a state of, of insanity caused by this overwhelming sense of guilt? that she was unprepared for and her mind snaps. We know shortly that she kills herself, certainly suggesting um, that her mind has snapped. Also suggesting that this whole attitude that as long as we don't get caught, we're fine. We don't have to worry about morality and ethics and all this stuff. That's, that's men don't worry about things like that. Men just act. It's the recognition that that's untrue in this world. Right? And then it descends and crushes her. And, not, and, and as it crushes Macbeth, but in a different way. Right? Because Macbeth was always acknowledging that. It's as if Lady Macbeth never thought there would ever be any sense that, I would, that she would feel guilty. So when it comes, it's overwhelming. Macbeth feels guilt right after the murder, remember? So he's anticipated this. That's when he starts devising his plans. I mean, arguably, he falls into a, a state of madness, but it doesn't come so suddenly that it wipes him out the way Lady Macbeth is wiped out. He's now still, you know, with the hope that the, the witch's prophecies and he you know, can't be killed by anyone born of woman and all this. Um, is, is then saying, getting you know, whatever, I can take you all on. You can't hurt me. But Lady Macbeth can't get there. She is buried by her guilt. Right? And, and of course, revealing things here to um, the doctor and the gentlewoman, right? Do, do you mark that? The Thane of Fife had a wife. Where is she now? Okay, so the, they're saying, do you hear? She's revealing things. And they're hearing it. And now she's acknowledging Lady Macbeth is all the sins that she's been a part of. Will these hands never be clean? She has blood on her hands and is desperately, I gotta get the blood out. I gotta get the blood out, but she can't. There's no blood there. No literal blood. Uh, and again, she's revealing things. You have known what you should not. She has spoke what she should not. I am sure that heaven knows what she has known. Now this, we touched on this in class as well. And, and just as a reminder, um, there is that element of theology being introduced here, right? Um, we see a bit of it. Heaven knows what she has known, right? So there is this, shout out or this suggestion, you know, of this sense of guilt coming from um, a religious perspective. But it's not crystal clear. And, and this is one of the things we, we have to explore is where is that sense of guilt in Lady Macbeth coming from? And argue, arguably, it's coming from herself. She's not the one who's saying heaven knows or anything like that. It's the gentlewoman and the doctor. 
But we've seen earlier that Lady Macbeth is never concerned about those things until now. Here's the smell of the blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Um, her hand, and the doctor points out, her, the heart is sorely charged. Um, and he goes on to say, this disease, the disease that Lady Macbeth is suffering from here, and he's a doctor, is beyond my practice. It's not a physical disease. Yet I have known those which have walked into sleep who have died wholly in their beds. Right? They're trying to figure out what, what is this ailment? What ails Lady Macbeth? They're getting hints that she's done something really wrong. Right? Which is, again, adding to the idea that she is experiencing some kind of mental derangement. And then again, wash your hands, put on your nightgown, look not so pale, right? That's, that's we've seen Lady Macbeth doing that, saying it to, late, to Macbeth. You know, go wash your hands. Remember, put on your nightgown. We have, to, we have to make everyone believe that we've been in bed, not that we've been out murdering the king. Right? Put on your nightgown, look not so pale. Put on your mask. And she's saying it, you know, this is a harping back to that moment when she says exactly that to Macbeth after Macbeth has stabbed the king. She seems to be saying it to herself now. Right? Still trying to hold on to what she had before. Okay, just wash your hands. Just wash your hands. Get over this. Come on. Don't look so pale. You got to put on, you know, you got to put on the act. But as we saw just a few minutes ago, but then I tell you yet again, Bank was buried. He cannot come out of one's grave. Right? Insisting. There is, uh, trying to convince herself just as she had convinced Macbeth. Don't worry about it. He's dead. Dead is fine. Death is final. There's not, you know, this now she's referring to the killing of Banquo, which remember, she was not part of the plot to kill Banquo. Right? She was all behind and she plot, plotted and, and it was her strategy on how to kill Duncan, flawed as it was. But Banquo, that's something that Macbeth decided to do on his own, but she know, obviously knows about it, right? And she's trying to convince herself. Remember, she's in a sleepwalking state, right? which harps as well back to a bit of that supernatural, you know, unworldly state of mind. I'll tell you again, Bank was buried. He cannot come out of his grave, right? It's also harping back. Right, to the to, to seeing the ghost. You, know, you, know, you remember, Macbeth's the only one who sees Banquo's ghost. So it's, it's like he's buried. He can't come out of his grave. Stop freaking out. Get your mind together. She said that to Macbeth, and now she's seemingly trying to say it to herself. To bed, to bed, there's knocking at the gate. Harping back, remember that, though knocking at the gate, which starts happening when she's trying to get Macbeth out of his crazy state, his state, his distraught state after he has killed Duncan. And she's basically, you know, come on, man. And then there's that knocking, which turned out to be Macduff and company coming to get the king. To bed, to bed, there's knocking at the gate. Come, 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 give me your hand. What's done cannot be undone. To bed, to bed, to bed. And she weeps. Yeah. And that's the last time we see her. And we saw the video in class, and you see how Judy Dench in that particular performance really conveys that sense of anguish and despair and madness. Mind has snapped because of the overwhelming sense of guilt, overwhelming in part because she was never willing to acknowledge that anything like that existed. Right? And again, Macbeth 
has always been aware that it's possible, that it's there, that it's wrong. Macbeth never acknowledges that what they did was wrong. Macbeth did before the act even. We can't do this. This is wrong. After he does it, this was horrible. This was wrong. But then he has his turn. Right? And then he starts saying, and his determination is emboldened because he knows and this is a big difference, something to keep in mind. Macbeth knows he's done something horrific and wrong. And Macbeth understands the concept of guilt. Lady Macbeth never seems to. So when it hits her, it destroys her. Macbeth was always aware of it. So his descent into madness and erratic behavior and so on is coming from a very different position insofar as he has knowingly, when it gets the sense that if Lady Macbeth had known or experienced or understood that sense of guilt and how wrong it was, that she would have been like Macbeth, so no, we can't do this. She never seems to be fully aware of the implications of, of, of the action. Macbeth was aware. Just he seems to be weak and under the um, pressures applied to him by Lady Macbeth goes through with it anyways. So his descent is um, more nuanced because it wasn't an overwhelming suddenness of the realization of what he's done, which seems to be what happened to Lady Macbeth. It's gradual eating away at the brain, because as we saw after his last meeting with the witches, where he gets all this assurance, don't worry, no one can kill you, no worry, you'll, you'll, no one's gonna take away your throne until you know wood start to walk, and so on. Even so, he says, I, 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 I'm not taking any chances. So I'm, 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 I, I've got to, I still have to work out for Macduff. Macduff's in England. He's in England. All right, I'm going to go kill his entire family. I'm going to order his entire family killed. If that's when we really see, this is now a different kind of madness, if you will, than Lady Macbeth experiences. Because he's functional. Lady Macbeth in the scene is not functional. Okay. Um, so now we noticed as well, structurally in act five, things are quite different, right? The, the scenes are multiple scenes and they're very, for the most part, very short, right? That's also to convey that sense of movement, of action, right? There's a lot of battle sequences and so on. And it's almost like we get a sense that now we're rushing to the end. Remember act four is only three scenes. And here we have what is 11 scenes, I believe, right? So it's a very much, it's a very different dynamic that's unfolding here in Act 5. It's almost like now we're in the final leg of the, of the race and we're sprinting now, boom, boom, diff to that, boom, all right? Um, and we get a lot of information and, and things are happening very fast. So Malcolm and Macduff um, are coming, um, to Scotland, right? Um, we see here in the country near Dunsinane, um, we have soldiers and we're hearing that the English power is near, led on by Malcolm and his uncle Seward and the good Macduff, right? They're, they're, they're coming and they're coming to get rid of Macbeth. And remember what was said, they, they, they were told by Ross and others, get here to Scotland. Bring your 10,000 troops, and as soon as you land, people are so unhappy with Macbeth because Macbeth is not governing well. He's, he's, he's not thinking about that. He's, up, he's more and more descending into this obsession of preserving himself. It's narcissistic at this point. It's all about him. So they're saying you come here to, to Scotland with your troops, and as you start marching towards Mac, Macbeth, Everyone in Scotland's going to join you. Scott, Macbeth has no allies 
in Scotland. Everyone hates Macbeth. But he still has his army. And the army still has a sense of duty to their king. Because technically, Macbeth is still the king. But as we heard earlier, you know, they're, they're there out of a sense of duty, not out of love, right? Which is a little bit of a, a hint at and a throwback to King Duncan, who was also the king. People were duty bound to serve him, but he was also loved. He was also regarded as a good man, a man who cares about the people of Scotland. Macbeth does not have that quality. He might have had it before he crossed to the dark side. Remember at the beginning, he's very highly praised. A great general, great warrior, very dutiful to Scotland and to the king. And then he runs into the witches and that's ambition is sparked. When we get the first major theme that we, did, that we looked at, ambition. And of course, what we're also going to discover in this Act Five is those riddles that the the witches um, gave to Macbeth. Right, you, you can't be killed by anyone other who born of a woman, and you have uh, you will not be deposed unless Burnham Wood, right, uh, moves to to does the name, right, and as Macbeth said, well, that's impossible. Both these things are impossible, but always remember back to there, that scene, is any time Macbeth started to ask questions, which is said, no questions, you just have to listen. The idea behind that, right? remember, Macbeth questioned everything at the beginning. That wishy-washiness, which he was berated for by Lady Macbeth. And Macbeth's nature was to ask questions and to mull it over, and that's when he concludes, no, we can't do this, it'd be wrong. But then Lady Macbeth convinces him no to do it as long as we don't get caught. When he was with the witches the last time, he wants to ask questions. Right? He's desperately trying to hold on to that rational part of himself. But the witches don't let him. No questions. Just listen. Without the questions, to be able to pick apart the riddles, then they just sound perfect when they're far from it. And remember, Macbeth makes the decision after that I will no longer be think. I will no longer think things through. I will act. No more thinking, just action. Which, of course, is very much from Lady Macbeth's approach at the beginning of the play. Now Macbeth, after that last encounter with the witches, fully adopts the same thing. I'm not going to think about the implications. I'm not going to think about what the consequences could be, which is exactly what he was doing in contemplating killing Duncan, and that's why he concluded that he shouldn't, because it would be wrong. Now he's no longer doing that, so as soon as he thinks of Macduff, Macduff's in England, my heart tells me I'm going to go kill his family, and I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to give myself an opportunity to realize how wrong it is. Just do it. What does the tyrant, Macbeth, and again, note here the hints that we're getting, especially coming right after the scene with Lady Macbeth, some say he's mad, okay? He's fortifying Dunsinane, um, and some say he's mad. Others that lesser hate him do, do call it valiant fury. But his behavior, right, what this is telling us, whether it's valiant fury or madness, his behavior is erratic. Yeah. Is it madness? Is it valiant fury? Interesting question. What kind of question I'd probably want to be thinking about as I prepare for the exam. Right. Um, Right, and here is where it says, those he commands move only in command, nothing in love. Now does he feel his title hang loose about him like a giant robe upon a dwarfish, dwarfish thief, right? So it, it's also a commentary on what kind of power he actually can have as a king, as a ruler. 
um, when he has alienated everyone, right? And people are, are, are following him only because they're commanded to, not because they care about what he believes in or what his goals are or anything like that. So there's a commentary about, a continued commentary about how poor a leader he is. Um, we get to the next scene and Macbeth here is reminding himself and us, right? Bring me no more reports, let them fly off. Yeah, you know, uh, till Burnham would remove to Dunsinane, I cannot take with fear. You can bring me reports that the English are coming and they're, you know, they're, they're gonna try to attack me. I, I, I don't care, I'm not fearful because Burnham Wood has to remove itself and arrive at Dunsinane in order for me to fear anything. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not concerned, which of course impacts the way that he acts and the way that he rules as king. I don't care. I don't care about Scotland. I don't care about you. I'm fine. I have no fear because the witch has told me. What, what's the boy? What's the boy Malcolm, right? Because you know Malcolm is coming to take the throne. Was he not born of woman? I can't be killed by anyone born of woman. The spirits that know all mortal consequences have pronounced me thus. Fear not, Macbeth. No man that's born of woman shall ever have power upon thee. Then fly, false things, and mingle with the English of Piscaries. The mind I sway by and the heart I bear shall never sag with doubt nor shake with fear. I'm not going to doubt myself. I have no fear. Tell you, get all concerned, do whatever you want. I don't care. Right? And then the servant comes in, the devil damn thee black, thou cream-faced loon. Where gotst thou that? Goose look, right? Now, he's, again, these are indications, though. You have to watch these carefully. You can see how his demeanor now is so dismissive of others and aggressive, right? So are these examples of uh, the descent into madness? There is 10,000 geese, villain, right? Uh, soldiers, sir. Go prick thy face and overread thy fear, thou lily-livered boy. What soldiers, Patch? Death of thy soul, those linen cheeks of thine are counselors to fear. What soldiers, wayface? He's calling them names, Shakespearean name calling, nothing like it. Um, what soldiers, wayface? Uh, the English force so please you. Take thy face hence. Get out of my sight. We see him in this dismissive, arrogant, fearless mode. But we're seeing also, and the reason I'm spending a little time with this, because we didn't have much time to spend on it in class, is we're seeing this erratic behavior at the same time. Right? The, another example, you see how he's insulting, you know, just a servant, I'm calling them names, lily livered and, and, and linen cheeks and all this and dismisses of them. And then he's also here, this constant refrain back to, um, give me my armor. I'll fight, I'll fight till, till from my bones, my flesh be hacked, give me my armor. Well, it is not needed yet. They're not here, that's the miles away. You don't need your armor, sir. Um, I'll put it on, send out more horses, scur the country road, hang those that talk of fear, give me mine armor. And then quickly, how does your patient, doctor? So we're seeing this very erratic um, personality materialize here. And of course, how is your patient? He's referring to Lady Macbeth. Not so sick, my lord, as she is troubled with thick coming fancies that keep her from her rest. Cure her of that. Canst thou not minister to a mind 
diseased? Pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow? Raise out the written troubles of the brain and with some sweet oblivious antidote, cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart? It's very interesting what Macbeth is saying here. Cure. Can't you cure a diseased mind? Not body. Mind. It's as if Macbeth knows that she is lost her rationale, right? Can't you pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow? Right? Whatever is in the mind that is leading Lady Macbeth into madness and despair, you, doctor, can't you take that, that memory out of her mind, raise out the written troubles of the brain, and with some sweet oblivious antidote, is he mocking the doctor here? Right? Is he seriously saying, can't you, doctor, cure her? Or is he pointing out, you, doctor, can't cure this, what she has, right? Because, what, you don't have some sweet, oblivious antidote? Cleanse, that would cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff? which weighs upon her heart. Oh, you can't do that? You can't cure her? You can't fix a diseased mind? Really, doctor, you can't do that? And the doctor's response, there in the patient must minister to himself. So, what's going on here, right? Cure her of that. Cure her of what? This mind disease. Is he, in all this, is he talking about Lady Macbeth? Seemingly so, right? But is he not also talking about himself? Is this perhaps a recognition of his own diseased mind? And that's when the doctor says, uh, there in the patient, Lady Macbeth, and maybe you too, Macbeth, must minister to himself. Not herself. The doctor recognizing that Macbeth has a mind that is diseased, as as diseased as Lady Macbeth's, and that there's nothing he can do for that kind of ailment. Throw physic to the dogs. I'll none of it. <laughs> Come, put mine armor on. Right, this refrain of keep coming back to give me my armor. Give me my armor. Put mine armor on. It's like he's, 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 he's impatient to, for, 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 the, for them to arrive. And he's already been told, don't worry, they're not here yet. You don't need your armor. Give me my staff. Satan, send out doctor. The things fly from me. Come, sir, dispatch, if thou couldest, doctor, cast the water of my land. Find her disease and purge it to a sound and pristine health. So again, the question, is he sincerely asking the doctor, believing that the doctor can cure Lady Macbeth's diseased mind? Is he recognizing that his own mind has become diseased? Or is he mocking the doctor's inability, right? And purge it to a sound and pristine health, I would applaud thee to the very echo that should applaud again. Pull off, I, I say. What rhubarb, simi, or what purgative drug would scour these English heads? Hearest thou them? Aye, my good Lord, your royal preparation makes us hear something. Bring it after me. I will not be afraid of death and bane till Burnham Forest come to Dunsinane. All right? So you're getting a sense of where Macbeth's head is. He knows his wife, Lady Macbeth, is, right? Diseased mind. He seems to at least reference his own mind and seems to recognize that he's losing it as well. But then he keeps coming back, but it's gonna be okay. 
It's going to be okay because I can't be hurt. I can't be hurt. Everything's going to be fine, right? I don't have to worry about guilt or anything like that. I've crossed that threshold. I used to worry about that, but now I'm no longer. I'm no longer. Something that Lady Macbeth couldn't do. Lady Macbeth then discovers guilt and it destroys her. Whereas the guilt in, in Macbeth has always been there, eating away. And what seems, it's almost as if the prophecies that the witches have, have given to Macbeth about his invulnerability are like adrenaline, like a drug that's keeping him alive, keeping him from falling into total madness. He keeps coming back to, give me my armor. And don't worry, I will not fear death or anything until Burnham Forest come to Dunsany. We're back now with Malcolm and Macduff. And here we, of course, it's revealed to us, you know, we're, we're just ending this little brief scene here uh, with the Till Burnham Forest come to Dunsany. Well, Malcolm tells his generals, let every soldier hew him down a bow and bear us before him. Thereby shall we shadow the numbers of our host and make discovery air in report of us. Have everyone cut down the branches, the wood of Burnham, Burnham Forest. Let's cut it down and use it to hide and mask our movement. And we will go from here, Burnham Forest, with all the boughs and branches and we're gonna to move towards Dunsany. And that's how the forest moves, right? And that's going to have an impact because Macbeth is still going on. I will not be afraid of death and bane till Burnham Forest come to Dunsany. Well, here it comes. Didn't see that coming. Um, and again, a reminder, right? We're being told and none serve him, but constrained things whose hearts are absent too, right? Everyone is supporting this resurrection, this uh, revolt. And let's go. Now, we spent a lot of time on this. It is obviously important. It's just a very brief reminder because I realized I'm almost at an hour already. Um, but this is when it's revealed that Lady Macbeth is dead, right? So Satan comes in and he, Macbeth, wherefore was that cry? The queen, my lord, is dead. And then just one last time, and for no other reason, I just love reading it, but to be thinking about the implications of this. Like there's so many possible entries into an understanding of what Macbeth is going to remember. We're seeing Macbeth in this very now reflective mode contemplating the death of Lady Macbeth after we've seen how manic he has been. Right? And again, leading up to it, Macbeth says, I have almost forgot the taste of fears. Right? The prophecy is what? The time has been, my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek. Right? Because that's hearing. Lady Macbeth shrieking. Remember when we watched the previous video of, of Lady Macbeth, scene one, act five, which we watched a couple of weeks ago, and some of you were noting that scream that Judy Dench gives out in playing the role of Lady Macbeth, right? Well, here we have Macbeth, we've heard another scream. And the time has been, has been, right? I'm going to play on this sense of time, which is very much contained in this tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow speech. The time has been, there was a time in the past when my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek and my fell of hair would at a dismal trees rouse and stir as life were in it. He's reflecting on back when he did have feelings and thoughts and understanding of guilt. Maybe he still has an understanding of guilt, but he doesn't act accordingly. But this is very important. He is going back. There was a time, that time being when he was saying, we shouldn't kill the king. Would at a dismal treaties rouse and stir as life were in it. I have supped full 
with horrors. Direness, familiar to my slaughterous thoughts, cannot once start me. There was a time in the past, it's no longer there. Wherefore, with thy cry, the queen, my lord, is dead. And she should have died hereafter. This is our last really intense moment with Macbeth. Demonstrating that he can still think. But now his thoughts are taking into account not just what he was like, but what he's become and how that has transformed his whole perspective. And she should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, the future. It's in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. So again, all these references to time tomorrow, time, hereafter. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace. So I'm walking. Pace the way you pace yourself when you walk. Day to day, to day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. For eternity, till death. And all our yesterdays, back to the past, have lighted fools. Everything we've done in the past has given light to fools. have lighted fools the way to dusty death, have shown, lit up everything we've done. All our yesterdays have lighted fools, have given light to fools, showing them the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief camp. Brief candle, of course, that harps back to the candle, harps back to what we saw with Lady Macbeth in the sleepwalking scene, carrying the candle. Candle here symbolizing life. Out, out, brief candle, that's death. All the yesterdays just lighted fools. Are we all people just fools? And the past has no relevance, what he was in the past, can't help him in the present. Life's but a walking shadow. Life, in life we are just walking shadows. We're just poor players. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage. Of course, we see the obvious references and analogy to the theater itself, because we're it's this theater, this is a play. So he is suggesting as well that what goes on in the theater, what goes on on the stage of a play is a reflection of life, that we all have our moment on stage where we strut and we fret when we're on the stage. And then is heard no more. We're all fools, poor players, briefly have our moment on the stage. We've just been trotting along from the past. The yesterdays have lighted us us fools only towards a dusty death of 
nothing more. We have our moment on stage. It's Macbeth's moment on stage, he's king. But we're just shadows, poor players, and we strut and we fret when we have our hour on the stage, but then we are heard no more. It, life, is a tale, just a story, a tale, a fairy tale, a story. It is, just, it is a tale told by an idiot. The idiot goes back to the fool and the poor player. Are we all just idiots? Our stories are so meaningless. Our tales, our hour on the stage. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury. Life. Not just Macbeth's life, not just Lady Macbeth's life. All of our lives, everyone's life, full of sound and fury. But as Macbeth suggesting, but we're all just fools. Because even with that sound and fury, for that hour we have upon the stage, where we're strutting and fretting and having our moment. Ultimately signifies nothing. Remember, we talked about in class this idea mainly coming from Lady Macbeth in the first part, that without God, without a belief in that higher power and sacred texts and the possibility of life after death, salvation, paradise, whatever it may be, if all that matters is just don't get caught, there are no other repercussions. Then life is meaningless, has no significance other than the intensity of our moment on the stage. Is that what this play is about? Is that a commentary on the individual? Remember the relationship of the individual to the state, to the cosmos. Is this just Macbeth's perspective? Was this always Beth, Macbeth's perspective? Certainly don't get that sense. This is where he has arrived to. And he's arrived here because of his actions, because of his strutting and fretting, and because of the choices he makes. Suggesting that we as humans, as individuals, are the product of the choices we make, not just necessarily physically, but in our perception of the world. And Macbeth's perception of the world at this stage is that life has no significance except for while you are on the stage. Now that is debatable, obviously, and we know that what Macbeth's state of mind is at this point. It certainly would not, we don't get the sense he would have said that back in act one or two where there was significance in our actions. Can't kill King Duncan, it would be wrong. That gives significance. Our decisions are predicated on moral and ethical choices that impact others and impact those around us, allows others to strut and fret upon the stage. It gives meaning. Without that, without that sense of morality, and ethics, there's no significance. But with it, is there significance? Doesn't tell us. 
we know what's going to happen now. Macbeth is going to get killed, right? We're going to know that uh, that Macduff was not born of woman technically, right? It was C-section. And Macduff is going to cut off Macbeth's head. But Macbeth is going to be dead and things will go on. Malcolm will become king. We never get resolution to the idea, going back to the witch's prophecies, whether Banquist's children are going to um, be royalty kings over a long period of time. Remember the image with the last time we saw the witches? All the kings of Banquist's line. Doesn't tell us. Remember, all this was initiated by the supernatural, these witches who bring chaos and disruption. Fair is foul, foul is fair. Right? And it's that the, the, the play is about that disruption. Ultimately, that type of disruption destroys the individual. Macbeth is destroyed. Lady Macbeth is destroyed. But we are left with hope because we have the restoration of order at the end of the play. And what is that suggesting then? That if, say, Macbeth, I'm going to wrap it up here. The rest of this is just the fighting um, and revealing of Mac Macduff's uh, having been born of a C-section. Um, we know, again, Macduff's seeking revenge. I mean, we talked about that in class. Because obviously, his family was killed. Um, Note here, little things. I mean, we were wondering, does Macbeth have any remorse towards the end? All right, we have here, we'll get to in scene eight, another part of the field, enter Macbeth. Why should I play the Roman fool and die of my own sword? Right, the tradition of Romans killing themselves rather than being taken prisoner, humiliated. While I see lives and gashes do better upon them, he's still thinking himself invis invincible. Um, Macduff, turn, hellhound, turn, of all men else I have avoided thee, but get thee back. My soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. It's an interesting moment here. Is there any suggestion here that Macbeth is feeling guilt? Of all men else I have avoided thee, Macduff, but get thee back. My soul, this is an interesting line. I know I'm going over the hour, so I'm going to try and wrap it up quick. But my soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. This reference to soul, the suggestion, it's a suggestion. It's something that has to be contemplated, and I suggest that you contemplate it. After the tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow speech, do we see any signs of Macbeth starting to move away or at least halt his progression towards utter um, indifference, madness, whatever it is that we saw leading up to it? Remember how erratic his behavior was until he finds out about Lady Macbeth's death. Then we have this very seemingly quiet reflection where he is talking about life in a very despairing way. Does he have a moment of realization in that at that time? And is that reflected here? You know, I, my soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. I have no words, Macduff says, my voice is, is in my sword, thou bloodier villain than terms can give thee out. Remember I asked you in class, 
and we, we didn't have enough time really to fully pursue it. Do we have any sense of sympathy um, or would we, any would any of us contemplate forgiving Macbeth or Lady Macbeth? Right? Look how Lady Macbeth, the demise of Lady Macbeth. Not so the demise of, of Macbeth, but we saw what he was like. Right? And general consensus is once he crosses that line, then no. There's no way to care, and we just want him to die and be removed from the stage. We want his strutting and fretting to end. Is that how we all feel? Is that how we all think? Is that what the play suggests to us? And then we can't ignore these types of things. Is he feeling guilt? And if he is feeling guilt, if his madness is caused for the same reason that Lady Macbeth's madness was realized, because of guilt, is there no room for forgiveness and redemption? Was it truly a line that Macbeth and Lady Macbeth crossed? Were there not to be given any opportunity to make amends? I, I don't know. That's something that the play asks us to think about, I would suggest. Does it matter that he may be feeling that his soul is much too charged because he has, remember blood, what does blood represent? The guilt. He's expressing his sense of guilt. Does he express remorse? Doesn't seem to be, but does he? Can you have guilt without remorse? <laughs> they fight. Um, and this is when Macduff reveals that he was uh, was from his mother's womb, untimely ripped. And that, of course, Macbeth has already realized that the force did move. Ooh, not good, but that's okay. I still can't be killed, right? Well, I wasn't born of a woman. A curse be that tongue that tells me so, for it hath cowed my better part of man. And be these juggling fiends no more believe that palter with us in a double sense. Juggling fiends, of course, that's the witches. And no, these juggling fiends no more can be believed. Right? He's just finding out that, oh my God, I'm done. That palter with us in a double sense, equivocation. That's why they didn't want him asking questions. <laughs> That keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope. I'll not fight with thee. Why is he again? Is that because he's scared now? Is that because he still feels um, that guilt from the blood on his hands from killing his family? Then yield thee, coward, and live to be the show and gaze of the time. We'll have thee as our rare monsters are. Right. So we're now we're getting Macduff. It was you know voice and perhaps for us, and it doesn't matter. You are a monster, and I, there's no, in any way, can I, Macduff, <coughs> care at all about anything you may be thinking. You're a monster, you must die. And of course, with Macduff, who also knows that Macbeth killed his whole family. I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet. Pride? And to be baited with rabble's curse, to be paraded as a prisoner. Right? This harks back to the idea of what the Romans did, the reason the Roman generals or, or people in power would rather kill themselves than be captured so they wouldn't have to be humiliated in front of the rabble. 
though Burnham would be come to Dunsinane, and thou opposed be of no woman born, yet I will try the last. Before my body I throw my warlike shield, lay on, Macduff, and damn be him that first cries, hold enough. What's he saying here? Macbeth at the very end, after the tomorrow and tomorrow speech, after that, and that's a moment, I would suggest. Again, because it has to be contrasted with everything that happens after that, with the way he was before that speech, where he was so erratic, calling for his armor and, and, and name calling of his, of his servants and, and, and his ridiculing of the doctor or that whole exchange with the doctor. And here he's saying, you know, this also can be harping back a bit to the idea of what constitutes a man, that, that element, that theme that we've seen repeatedly here. Yet I will try the last before my body, I throw my warlike shield, lay on Macduff, and Dan be him that first cries hold enough. I will go down fighting. Even now I know I don't have the protection that I thought I had, I will not yield. Is this him standing up one last time to be a man and die in glorious battle with his foe? One last moment of sound and fury on the stage, even if you are a fool? and a poor player? Is this his last moment on the stage where he can express that sound and fury? And if so, what does that mean? Is it, is it, is it a, um, indication that that nihilistic view that everything signifies nothing is what he believes in this moment or does he by the action we see after that is there a suggestion that in fact the sound and the fury perhaps does signify something all right um Re-enter, they fight, and so on. Re-enter Macduff with Macbeth's head. Hail, king, for so thou art, behold. And we have it nicely and neatly packed up for us at the end. Now we have a proper king of Scotland. Remember, we know it's proper because back when Duncan was alive, he openly proclaimed that Malcolm is my heir. And it comes back into that whole thing when we talk about the flaws in Lady Macbeth's plot, not taking that into account, and how that, that sense of luck, and the wheel of fortune helped them out in so that because Malcolm fled and therefore couldn't become king, and then it fell to Lady Macbeth to become king. That goes back to the play on free will versus predestination and that element of chance. combined with the idea of equivocation. I mean, it's just so much that's going on here. Uh, producing forth the cruel ministries of this dead butcher, Macbeth, and his fiend-like queen, Lady Macbeth, who, as just thought by self, of violent hands, took off her life, she killed, this is where we get the confirmation that she killed herself. This and what needful else that calls upon us, by the grace of grace, interesting line, it's meant by grace, we will perform in measure, time and place, so thanks to all at once and to each one whom we invite to see us crowned at skull. Now it's Malcolm's hour upon the stage. <laughs> All right. Again, suggest you reread it 
one more time before the exam. The question will be designed, or questions, you give you a choice, um, to allow you to approach it from many different perspectives. You're gonna have to make the choices as to how you want to answer the question, which will be fairly general in nature. At least one of them will be, okay? And remember, it's a five paragraph. You need that thesis statement. You need to develop an argument. Does Macbeth deserve to die? It won't be that. <laughs> but that would be the time you'd have to say yes or no, right? That's, and then prove it. Make your argument, knowing that someone could disagree with it. Okay, something along those lines. You may have to dig a little bit, but take the time before the exam to think before you write. Put together that outline, mini outline. Think before you write, and just be sure you are fully familiar with the play. All right, we'll see you um, at the college on Monday.